Okay, it's um, exactly six o'clock here in Japan. So, so let's get started. Um, welcome to this Osaka University anniversary lecture series. I'm Brendan Barrett and I'm the organizer of this uh, series and moderator today. I'm a professor, let's just stop my email, I think, excuse me. I'm a professor at the Center for the Study of Co-Design at Osaka University, um, specializing in urban system sustainability, um, climate change and science communication. So our topic today is climate science in the context of the sustainable development goals and really thinking about what we can expect over the next decade, which as you'll see from the presentations today is critically important. So in the panel, uh, we have three of the world's leading um, scientists in the area of climate change. And what I would like to do is to actually begin by asking them to briefly introduce themselves. So perhaps uh, we could begin with Prof Professor Matt Mark Masling from University College London. Welcome and... Thank you, Brendan, and thank you for inviting me. So I'm a professor of Earth System Science at University College London, and I study the climate change of the planet in the past, the present, and the future. Uh, I also co-founded in 2012 a company called Resitec, which works on AI geoanalytics, and we provide solutions for um, NGOs, companies, and governments, so they can monitor their environmental data. And also, I have just published a book with Penguin called How to Save Our Planet, The Facts, which hopefully is a slightly more upbeat version of all those climate change books that um, certain worthy people and billionaires have been publishing recently. <laughs> Not to mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't want to they might be listening in <laughs> they might might see a copy of this uh, this recording okay thank you very much and you're most welcome Mark. so next um, professor shokoba dakal from asian institute of technology yes thank you brendan uh, first of all uh, thank you for having me here uh, japan always sits in a very special part of my heart brendan uh, actually i lived in japan for 15 years uh, before actually i i left uh, japan uh, I'm from Asian Institute of Technology. I'm a professor at the Department of Energy, Environment, Climate Change. Uh, right now, I'm also serving as a vice president for academic affairs for Asian Institute of uh, Technology. So my area is mostly energy and climate policy, you know, energy, climate accounting, modeling, and also I do a lot of work on cities and climate change. Uh, I have worked with the different assessments, particularly IPCC, AR5, and AR6. Uh, right now, uh, we are finalizing uh, AR6 mitigation, uh, working group three. Also, a couple of other assessments, the Citizen Climate Change Assessment Report through uh, UCCR and Urban Climate Change Research Network, also Global Energy Assessment, and recently, Hindukus Himalayan region energy assessment. So I've been into the, this assessment business for, for quite some time. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, and you're most welcome. Um, we have known each other for over a decade, and I've seen that you've done so much work with the IPCC in recent years, but today you're here in an individual capacity, True. not yeah. speaking on behalf of the IPCC. No, not at all. Okay, great. You're most welcome. And uh, our third panelist is uh, Rocky Alassan from the Bartlett uh, Faculty of the Built Environment, one of the most prestigious um, planning architecture schools. And I think you're an architect by training, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, thank you very much, Brendan, for that. So my name is Rakaya Aslan, and I am Vice Dean of Enterprise for the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment. I'm an architect by background and I'm an associate professor of building performance simulation. So most of my work focuses on the impacts of climate change on the built environment, how the built environment, um, how, how we can get the built environment to contribute to the climate uh, challenge and um, looking at sort of more of the policy focus side. So most of my work focuses on um, doing assessment for the British government via the Department of Building, uh, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, I also advise the Committee on Climate Change here in the UK, which sets the carbon targets 
uh, for uh, the, the country. And we've been also doing some work beyond the UK for the Irish government and the Omani government as well. Great, thank you very much. Lovely to have you as one of the panelists. So in terms of the narrative for today's session, uh, Mark's gonna kick off and talk about uh, the climate science and how that connects to the SDGs. And then Shobhaka will talk about climate mitigation, what we can expect over the next decade. And then Rocky will bring it down to the ground to the impact on developing economies and looking at workplace issues and issues like East, uh, heat stress, et cetera. So, um, you know, think about it from the big picture down to the uh, very close to you on the ground. And uh, that's, that's how we're going to approach the session today. Just a, a few points before uh, Mark begins his presentation. There is actually a Q&A box um, that is uh, basically for you to type your questions in. So during any of the presentations, if something comes to mind, please type in there and then we can see, the panelists can all see the questions and we'll get around uh, to answering them at the end. The approach is that each uh, presenter will talk for around 20 minutes and then we'll have the Q&A session. Um, if your name is appearing as a member of the audience using uh, Chinese characters, could you please um, type it in Roman alphabet so that we can uh, also monitor attendance there. We have a fantastic student attendance here. It's a very diverse group. It includes uh, Osaka University students, but I saw there were students from the Philippines, from Indonesia, from China, and also uh, UCL students joining us today as well. So we've got a great group attending. And I'm really looking forward to the presentations. So Mark, with that, can I pass over to you? Certainly, I will share my screen. Does that look okay? That looks fantastic. Perfect. So my job today is to try and give you an introduction to both the sustainable development goals and climate change. And actually quite a lot of the stuff you'll be hearing you probably already know, and I'm just hopefully adding a little bit of depth to that knowledge. And I think what is really interesting is that we have just been in a global pandemic. However, the idea of climate change and the politics of climate change, instead of going away as it did when we had the financial crash in 2008, if anything, it's got more urgent. People have got more serious about dealing with it and the politics has completely changed over the last six months. So this is why I use this cartoon, which is scientists looking at the COVID curves and saying, can we flatten them? And of course, there's a huge curve of climate change behind. So why are the sustainable development goals required? So let's actually look at the state of the modern world. Seven million children die needlessly every single year because of preventable diseases and because of starvation. 825 million people go to bed feeling hungry every night and that's gone up by 25 million in the last five years. It's the first time in the modern era that that number has actually risen. And one billion people still do not have access to clean, safe drinking water. That's one in eight of us. So that's why the Sustainable Development Goals are so important. So the Sustainable Development Goals, there's 17 of them which are aiming to lift people out of poverty and to actually develop uh, economies around the world. And you can split them up into sort of three main ones. The biosphere, things like looking after the oceans, water, climate change. You then have society looking at different things such as prosperity, uh, education. You then have the economy. And then you have the overall goal, which is to actually boost everybody's life expectancy and well-being. So how does that interact with climate change? So let's go back to stage one. What is climate change? So if you think about it, the sun's energy heats the planet. So most of that energy is in the light or in the visible range. And about a third of it hits the white clouds or reflective white ice sheets on Earth and is reflected straight back into space. Two thirds of it actually gets through the atmosphere 
because the atmosphere doesn't really see that energy apart from ozone because that absorbs some high energy UV which is great because that prevents skin cancer and DNA damage but the majority of the energy literally just passes through the atmosphere as if it's not there. Now if you're uh, sunning yourself in uh, Japan or you're thinking of going on holiday which uh, we in the UK can only dream of um, you're lying out on your beach and you're soaking up the sun's radiation and what you find is you feel hot and the reason being is because that light when it hits your skin converts to heat and long wave radiation and you radiate that out exactly the same thing happens to the earth and when it radiates that heat out we have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that trap that heat for a little while and then release it which basically keeps the earth warmer. Now the most important greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and then we have things like CFCs and other uh, human produced chemicals. Now the interesting thing is if you took all of those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere the temperature of the earth would drop by about 30 degrees Celsius. So that would mean an average Japanese summer would be minus 10 and a Japanese winter would be something like minus 35. So greenhouse gases, good, except because of the industrial revolution, because of deforestation and all the things that go with modern society, we have been putting extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And actually we've increased the amount in the atmosphere by about 50% since the beginning of the industrial revolution. This is the famous Keeling curve and as you can see it just goes up. Now I'm a geographer, I hide in a geography department so I have to mention the little blue curve. That's the seasonal curve. Why does the actual amount of CO2 go up and down every single year? Simple geography. There's more land in the northern hemisphere so when we have spring and everything blooms like the wonderful sort of uh, cherry blossom in Kyoto actually it starts to suck out CO2 and of course because there's more land there's more plant growth than in the southern hemisphere so that's how you get that wonderful seasonal curve but it doesn't stop this uh, increase that's occurred and we are now at a level which is the highest for at least three million years so these are the ice core records going back 800,000 years uh, these are actually air bubbles so if you drill a core in Antarctica or Greenland and you extract the ice and you really carefully take out the air bubbles you can measure how much CO2 and methane are in those bubbles it's literally trapped ancient air and as you can see it goes up and down with the ice ages and then what do we do in the last 150 years well methane has more than doubled and CO2 has gone up by at least 50 percent we've taken the climate out of the normal cycles and way beyond where we've been for the last three million years. So can we see evidence of climate change up to now? Because again as scientists we want to see weight of evidence, we want to see multiple uh, ideas and uh, data sets. So here we have the first one A, northern hemisphere uh, spring snow cover has been decreasing since the 1960s which is really bad news if you happen to like skiing or snowboarding or any of those winter sports because that's slowly becoming a thing of the past. If we look at the Arctic summer sea ice extent you can see that has been dropping since the 1960s as well and one of the most worrying ones is the average temperature or the heat content of the oceans. Now the oceans cover 70% of the planet and they heat up and have a slow inertia and as you can see they have been just absorbing more and more heat. And then sea level. Sea level has been creeping up uh, all the way through the last century and is continuing to rise and is also starting to accelerate slightly. How about temperature? Well this is a comparison between the uh, summer of 1976 and the summer of 2018 and as you can see 
summer of 2018 was a global heat wave. So what about the annual temperature? So we can put all these data sets together. And as you can see, there has been this strong warming through to the present day. 2020 and 2016 are joint leaders for the warmest year ever recorded. However, not everybody gets on with uh, graphs. So Ed Hawkins from Reading University has produced this beautiful warming stripes approach whereby you can see this in a very visual color way. What's interesting about this, of course, is all the data is on his open source uh, website, and so you can download anywhere in the world. So this is the temperature change in Japan since 1901 to the present day. And clearly you can see the shift from very blue to very red conditions over the last 120 years. Now, also, this has become a little bit of a sort of, a, um, I would say, a fan base because you can now have ties. Uh, if you can afford a Tesla, you can wrap your Tesla in sort of a uh, uh, climate stripes to show how cool you are. Uh, of course, you can have T-shirts. It's not cool to be warm. And of course, you can have leggings. And I can go on and on. But these are a very visual way of representing climate change that has already occurred. So what about the future? Now, as a scientist, I would like multiple Earths to play with and actually do an experiment on each one of them, uh, except we only have one, which is very precious, so we really shouldn't experiment on it, even though we are doing one giant climate change experiment. Uh, so we then build models. So we have supercomputers based on the incredible uh, weather models, which we then uh, use. And we have this a network of uh, data points around the world, both around spatially, but also into the atmosphere, the ocean and the land. And on the right hand side, I just wanted to show how the resolution of those models have increased since the first report in 1990 all the way through to the current report which is going to be published later this year and that's about down to 100 kilometers. That's all due to the increased power of computing. Um, you've got one in your pocket, that amazing mobile phone. What's really strange is the answer from the science from 1990 to the day hasn't actually altered that much despite us knowing more and having a lot more computer power. So what do these models say? Well, if we look at we having no climate policies, we would be looking at four to five and a half degrees warming. The current policies, if they are successful, would mean that we would keep it to 3.1 to 3.7 degrees. The pledges, so these are all the great things that have been coming out in the last 12 months, where countries go, we're going to do this. Even with those pledges, it would only keep the temperatures to 2.6, 3.2. And then there are the two aspirational pathways, the two degree pathway and the one and a half degree pathway, which I'm going to talk about later. But what does this actually mean for places around the world? So, for example, in Japan, uh, we had a huge heat wave in 2018 with temperatures hitting 41.1 degrees Celsius, um, which is unheard of. And of course, that's going to increase into the future. And I'll give you an example based on the modeling. So if we have the one and a half degree pathway, then actually we are looking at a one in four year will be as hot or hotter than 2018. A two degree pathway would mean that that will be every other year. And if we're into a three degree pathway, yeah, every year would be as hot as 2018 in Japan. So if we look at extreme rainfall events, uh, Japan has been hit by a number of huge uh, floods in recent years. These will, of course, become more common because of the amount of extra moisture and energy in the atmosphere. So what are the effects of climate change overall if we look globally? 
So increased sea level rise, which will cause coastal flooding and erosion. We'll have more extreme storms, floods, droughts, and heat waves, which we're already seeing. And of course, the wildfires, which are associated with the droughts and heat waves. And this is where it's key. This may lead to food and water insecurity. We have to be very careful with that because, of course, we already produce enough food to feed 10 billion people, but 825 million people are going hungry. So you have to be very careful about what is actually controlling that, and it's usually money and politics. It may also lead to migration and conflict. However, again, I say may because, of course, there are lots of reasons why people migrate, and of course, humans seem to use any excuse to actually have conflict if they want conflict. So therefore, climate change may be a threat multiplier. It is not a primary cause. So the UN Paris Agreement, which aims to avoid uh, sort of global warming, says that we need to cut our emissions to net zero during the 21st century. And they are very honest about what it would take. Achieving this will require a complete transformation of energy generation, industry, infrastructure, and personal behaviors. And I think what people are only now starting to realize is there is a huge difference between keeping it to one and a half degrees or allowing it to creep up to two degrees. And this is why the whole narrative of climate change and the SDGs have changed because it's all about one and a half degrees. Because as you can see, everything from coals, from fisheries, from the ecosystems to coastal flooding, crop yields, and heat-related morbidity and mortality all increase significantly between the one and a half and two degree temperature limit. So is it possible to keep the climate to one and a half degrees? And I know the other two excellent speakers are going to be picking up on this. So if we have a look at our historic uh, emissions, they peak at uh, 2020, they went down slightly in 2020, but we now need to drop to zero globally by 2050. Now, we already have the UK, Europe, and USA uh, pledging to be net zero by 2050. China has pledged to peak their emissions by 2030 and go carbon net zero by 2060. So we're starting to get some idea that countries are really taking this seriously. But what the scientists sort of forget to tell people, because it just makes it even worse, is to keep the temperatures at one and a half degrees, depending on how quickly, depends on how much CO2 we need to suck out of the atmosphere for the rest of the century. So we need win-win solutions. We need to really think about how we change the way we do everything in society, which produces very positive things for emissions, so they get reduced, but also positive things for human health, for society, and actually people's well-being and health. So the key thing here is that to achieve net zero carbon, we actually have nearly all the technologies we need. We have all the experts we would need to actually achieve that. And I reckon we have all the entrepreneurs we need. What we don't have currently is the policies and the politics. And there are three major groups that are going to be essential in basically saving our world, which is, of course, governments that provide the incentives, provides the regulation, and provides the framework for this aspirational uh, change in society. You have the corporations that can actually change their behavior very quickly and actually can fulfill the requirements of government. And then you have the individuals who demand change of the government and corporations, and their purchasing power can actually change how corporations operate. According to the Down Draw project, the world could save $46 trillion by shifting to a net zero carbon emissions pathway. 
So the one and a half degrees targets and the SDGs, you have to look at them in great detail because climate change is complex. Our global economy is complex. People call it a wicked problem. And that's because to actually get to that one and a half degree target, there will be some synergies, i.e. there'll be some very positive things that we can actually uh, improve by reducing emissions. For example, if we put renewable energy into developing country, that is a real positive thing because it improves the environment. It provides energy for people that require it. But there are trade-offs and there are things that will cause issues and we need to be aware of them that it is all not in a positive way. So we have to be able to assume and look at the SDGs and go, how do the two of these key aims in the 21st century work together? And where do we need to actually put extra effort in to offset the negatives that could occur? So for me, the battle against climate change will be won and lost in the post-COVID recovery. It's really interesting that we are having uh, the World Bank, the International Energy Authority, all now looking at the one and a half degree pathway and saying this is where the world needs to go and we need to change now. And so therefore I just put up two pictures. One of course is uh, Paris looking very green and very modern and, and of course uh, many of you who may be film uh, aficionados might recognize that as, of course, the final scene from Planet of the Apes, the 1960s version, where Charlton Heston is bashing the ground because he's realized that humans have burnt the planet up. And just to the end, thank you for listening, and I'm very happy to, with the other panelists, uh, answer any questions. Just thought, if you want some positivity and you want some solutions, I actually have written a book, How to Save Our Planet, The Facts, which really does focus on all the positive things we could do in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark, for an excellent presentation. And I have to confess that Planet of the Apes was one of the first movies I went to see as a kid. So that, <laughs> It's uh... still a brilliant, it is still a brilliant movie. Um, so, yeah. That resonated. The, the new ones don't capture it. <laughs> no, no, that did resonate with with me. Um, I tend to use um, for the apocalypse type pictures uh, Mad Max, but uh, Planet of the Apes also works yep. as well. Great. Or so, Blade Runner. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> really, really great presentation. And uh, and now our next presentation actually follows on from that very uh, effectively because it gets into the question of how do we mitigate. And um, just before Shokubha begins, could I just say to students who do have questions, there's one already pop, popped up there from Tanvi, uh, please put the name of the panelist who would like to answer the question um, in there so we can get round at the end to answering. Shobaka, would you like to uh, uh, get your presentation up? There we go. Okay. Just uh... Give me a second. No problem. Yeah, no, no problem. Let me just swap the screen. I think that's it. Yeah, I think you can see it, right? It's, sli it's slightly cut off. Okay. It's the same problem as we had in the beginning. If you could try just adjusting it. Yeah, it should be okay now. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, first of all, uh, thank you, Brendan, for this opportunity. Uh, I think the mark uh, already started uh, you know climate change uh, discussion and and he already you know touched upon some of the big challenges that we have and also uh, you know introduction of uh, paris agreement and some of the challenges that we have in order to go towards the very steep emission declining uh, you know graph that the mark showed. So what I'll try to do uh, in next uh, 20 minutes is uh, dwell myself into two questions. The first is that what do we, I mean, our experience on emission and mitigation, uh, what message does it give us uh, for next decade? So I'll try to go through some of the emission trajectory in the past and so 
few hopeful signs, but also so few difficult signs. Then I'll go to 1.5 degree, uh, try to see what does this mean uh, in terms of the speed, mitigation trajectory, and the needed effort for the next decade. So in this discussions, I'm trying to keep focus a bit on 2030, because you hear that uh, you know, our target is 2100 for 1.5 degree climate stabilization. Uh, Paris Agreement requires uh, net uh, carbon uh, zero world by around 2050. So I'll try to put a bit more thrust also on 2030, because it seems that for many countries, committing to 2050 or 2100 is easy, but committing to 2030 is, is a bit difficult because, because the policymakers, politicians have to show results, right? So there is, so keeping on the, you know, bit of a medium term, uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, do that. So on the first question, uh, what do our experience on emission and mitigation in the previous decade tells us about uh, the next decade. Uh, let, me, let me say a couple of things there. First is that we are definitely not on a good trajectory. Despite slowing down emissions growth, uh, I think Mark also mentioned that uh, in last two, three years, we have some slowdown and especially in uh, 2020 due to COVID, but definitely we are not on the good trajectory. So our history in the past doesn't give us much confidence that we can do it to a deep down, deep dive in emission that we want by 2030 in order to steer course for 1.5 degree climate stabilization. And the second point I also want to highlight is that we have seen COVID-19 blip. Uh, I, I'll show you how much percent of the emission CO2 emissions so we expect to be declined in, in 2020. Uh, and, but I'll also caution you that that may not help us unless we see deep structural change. Then I, I want to also give a little bit more silver lining on this uh, dark past trajectory of emission that there are a few silver linings there. Uh, but not necessarily that silver lining is because of the climate policy itself, but maybe due to the much more broader set of things. And there, there is a lot of hope uh, from energy and climate technologies uh, and, and a couple of points that, that I would like to uh, dwell upon. Having said that, uh, our past trajectory is not very helpful for us to think about future. You know, when we started making all noises about climate change from 1990, from UNFCCC, and you know, many international initiatives, still you can see that our carbon trajectory CO2 emission is quite going up and up and up. And especially if you see in the decade of 2000 to 2010, you see that the growth rate has been quite a phenomenal in that particular decade. Well, after 2010, uh, in, in last one decade, that, that rate has slowed down and we are at the situation of COVID-19 COVID in 2020, where we expect still many of these numbers are just an uh, expectation, uh, but we expect a bit of a dive in uh, emission. So what I'm trying to say here is that our past trajectory is not that great. Now, if you look at why our past trajectory is bad, which fuels are the culprits, you see very clear idea there, coal, coal, coal. If you look at from 2000 to 2010 in this figure between these two lines I put there, you see that the coal had jumped. Actually the contribution of coal in global CO2 emission really pushed upwards. Of course, that comes from lots of economic development and one key country which really fuels that is China, of course. But Coal is a, one of the major part uh, of this you know, rise in emission since 2000. Uh, but, but there are some good signs there. If you look at different countries, you see there that, uh, well, in China, of course, from 2000 to 2010, you see a huge uh, increase in CO2 emission. Uh, but India is kind of, you know, uh, slowly going up. The European Union is, is going, going down. The U.S. has started to decline in, in the last one decade. 
And in generally speaking, the total profile all is, is, is going up. Now, if you try to look at by country by country, you still see that the Chinese emission, CO2 emission has stabilized or in the bit of a, uh, you know, plateau, you know, plateauing kind of, you know, phase. But you see that there, particularly for the United States, uh, you know, some, some of this in trajectory now going down, uh, definitely the coal use has reduced. Uh, but of course, the gas has replaced, you know, lots of, you know, coal-fired power plants. So we have few good signs there, but also we, we have still that trajectory still much, much at higher level, and it's not that comforting at the end. Now, of course, uh, we, there is a lot of you know, equity discussions, as, as you know, uh, but still we see that, you know, in terms of equity, uh, even the country like China is already catching up with the European Union, for example, in terms of per capita uh, CO2 emission, while India is still low, but the United States is far, far way ahead of, of everybody else with 16.1 uh, tons of uh, CO2 per, per person. So what I'm trying to say here is that yes, OECD countries uh, seems to be a little bit either plateauing or many countries are a little bit improving the emission. Uh, emission uh, is, is going down, but at the same time from the developing countries and the regions, emission is, is going up. So that tension between developed and developing country and the historical responsibility that all of you know, creates a lot of difficulties is moving forward in terms of international cooperation or in terms of devising many other things that we all need to uh, come, come together. Now, this figure here shows consumption versus production based attribution of CO2 emission. Uh, you, what is important here is that in many developing countries such as China or India, you can see that a solid line is higher than the dotted line, which means that the production emission, production based attribution of CO2 emission is higher than the consumption best attribution of CO2 emission. But in case of uh, United States or European Union, uh, EU27, you see that dotted line is higher than the solid line. That means there is net transfer of the CO2 emission embodied in international trade there. So that means many of the developing countries uh, are producing emission in order to meet goods and service demand of the developed countries. But if you again try to look that into the per capita basis, basis in, in, in the figure in the panel, uh, right, uh, right of your panel, is that that gap is huge uh, when you look at uh, per capita basis for uh, production versus consumption. So these are very important uh, discussions because this question of mitigation is not only technology. It's a, it's a question of lifestyle. It's a question of the how we live, uh, behavior, consumption. So that particular debate is, is very, very important for us to bring into the next decade as we think about decarbonizing our society and our economic system. And I will just want to touch upon the COVID blip. So COVID blip has definitely reduced emission. You know, the recent paper by, you know, Karin, uh, you know, put in the, the nature uh, it says that the global CO2 emission declined by around 7% in 2020 compared to 2019 level. And, and of course, uh, you know, over the months, a lot of things has happened. But also, if you look at this, uh, you know, historical trajectory of emission, you also see that past crises, past crises have not helped us so much, whether it is the oil crisis of 1970s or U.S., saving and loan crisis of 1980, or even the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 90s, you see that emission has always rebounded. Now this COVID pandemic, which is giving us maybe 7% decline in, in 2020, how it will go forward. I think this that's why let's not be very much bullish about uh, this COVID blip because economy has to catch up, things will go, go back unless there is deep structural change in the economy, it, it didn't unleash, things would not be very easy. And that signs are already showing. 
For example, this one is a very recent uh, you know, report by International Energy Agency. Uh, it was published just uh, two months back, a month or two months back, which is already saying that in December last year, global energy related CO2 emissions were 2% higher than the December of 2019. So we are rebounding already. So this crisis is something we have to learn, but the real effect of the COVID-19 really depends on how deep structural uh, you know, implications or structural change it can unleash when it comes to the emission. Now, having said that, uh, of course, a lot of things we see, you know, even during pandemic time, we saw that the renewable energy, uh, you know, capacity installation has quite went up and the trend of moving away from fossil to renewable, that trend has, has continued. But in essentially, what I'm trying to say here is that the deep structural change really depends on our lifestyle choices. Did we learn from, uh, you know, doing Zoom, for example, like the one we are doing today? Or have you learned from lesser long distance travel? Have you learned to do localized activity? Have we learned to do online shopping and other things in a better way? Are we going to change our lifestyle and behavior a little bit different than what used to be in the past? At the same time, how we are going to work with the technology, whether it is renewable energy, whether it's a rapid divestment from fossil to the renewable you know, investments or fundamental change in structure of the economy. That is going to guide us, give us some clue what would be the impact of this in the future. Now, having said that, let me also touch on some of the progresses that are being made. I would call it the silver lining uh, in, in some of this dark trajectory, what, is, what you saw from 1970s onwards itself. Uh, now, if you, if you look at uh, some of the silver lining, uh, Mark talked about the Paris Agreement, and if you know that in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, uh, many pledges, commitments were made, nationally determined contribution, NDCs. Now, well, those NDCs were uh, good, nice, but not enough. Now, coming to 2021, from early days of Paris Agreement, now, 59 countries have submitted new NDC targets. Six countries have proposed new NDC targets. Still, the 99 countries have not had updated targets. But still, something is happening there. At, this, at the moment, 48% of the global emissions are covered by these new NDC submissions. So this kind of trend uh, has had to happen. It, 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 needs to, it needs to happen. Now, second silver lining I see is some reduction of emission in many countries. Almost three dozen of the countries have consistently reduced CO2 emission for more than a decade already. That number itself may not be huge, but, but that's a very good momentum. But how to sustain that and how to increase that rate of emission declining is very, very key for this coming decade uh, till 2030. And the several countries have decoupled or in the process of decoupling their CO2 from GDP growth. Either that is absolute decoupling or that is relative decoupling, decoupling but that decoupling we have seen. So these are some of the silver lining and we have to learn from this. We have to push this and we need to be more active to make sure that this sustains the rates increase and also other countries, other nations, we as a global citizen, everybody move towards that, that direction. Now, the second good, again, silver lining, other one is the cost reduction in key renewable energy technology. We have a pretty much a happy to see that, uh, you know, we have the solar and wind and CSP, they have made huge gains in the recent years. And we have uh, we have a lot to learn from this technological trajectory. The learning curve uh, rate has been quite good in this technology, and because of that, now we are more and more renewable into the electricity system. But at the same time, you know that uh, intermittent you know sources such as wind and solar needs to be coupled with the battery uh, storage technology. But we also seeing there are few good results that this 
Uh, storage technology price also slowly coming down. At least we have some better outlook in, in next one decade by, by 2030. So these are some of the good things uh, that we can harness, we can build, we can innovate, we can upscale and we can move, move ahead. Now, one important area is electric vehicles. We have crossed over 10 million electric vehicles. Uh, recently, uh, according to International Energy Agency, uh, you know, IEA report. And in many countries, for example, in country like Norway, almost, uh, you know, 60, 70, I think uh, almost 80, 80%, uh, yes, almost 80% of the new uh, car sale has been electric. But even in the China, for example, quite a handsome share of the new vehicles come to uh, coming to electric. Now, yes, electric is good, but also more and more renewable electricity is coming to the grid over the years. So that 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 is a huge uh, improvement in addition to other things, for example, air pollution and, and other things, it also uh, helps. So these are really the positive silver lining uh, that I said that we should be uh, happy about. Now, as a consequence, we have a renewable electricity mix in the total you know, capacity addition also in generation mix is, is increasing. Uh, we have almost 25, 26, 26% of the uh, renewable electricity in global electricity generation mix uh, in, in already. Now, if you look at the capacity addition, it's even higher. Almost it has reached 36.6% uh, you know, capacity. But as you know, the, again, this is an intermittent source, right? That's why the generation mix tend to be lesser than the capacity mix. But again, if you look at the recent years, you'll be happy to see that more and more renewable energy, uh, renewable electricity is adding to the capacity addition. Almost 82% of the net capacity addition in 2020 alone comes from the renewable. So these are some of the good signs and we have reason to be uh, happy about. But now, uh, these are some of the you know, good, good things. Now, let me, in, in the next few minutes, uh, talk about 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, Mark already touched, touched upon 1.5 degree Celsius. Uh, we all were uh, very, very happy in the Paris Agreement that we saved the world. Uh, but aspirations are good. 1.5 degree uh, aim is good, but it needs action. It needs measures and it needs collective work. Now, how to reach to 1.5 degree? Uh, yes, we might be happy to commit something for 2050, which is still good. You know, Mark already mentioned that, you know, for example, China committed uh, carbon neutral by 2060. Uh, many countries are doing by 2050 and many countries are uh, even China committing that China will peak by 2020, 2030 emission. But that emission pathway is very important. We have to find the emission pathway and we have to follow on the emission pathway. Some overshoot might be needed or possible if we cannot re reduce emission uh, very soon. That means to stabilize 1.5 degrees Celsius, maybe we have to go 1.7, 1.8 degrees, then we'll only come back to the 1.5 degree, right? So uh, just buying time, but that's, that's, we can't bank, we should not bank on that. Now, the good news is a lot of you know, so-called carbon neutrality places and new NDC places. Uh, now, it must go beyond NDCs and, and more and more countries need to be uh, placing uh, emission there. Now, of course, in IPCC 1.5 degree special report has laid out some of the analysis, including uh, some of the scenario for overshoot. Uh, I'll not uh, talk about that. Uh, if you have interest, uh, you can explore more. The P4 scenario that you see uh, relies a bit on the overshoot, but in any case, it requires the world to be carbon, uh, net carbon uh, zero by 2050, generally speaking, right? So now in that, uh, there is also some bit of a pessimistic uh, sort of you know, analysis. There is a recent paper published in Nature Communication uh, you know, very recent one, uh, which says that the probability of meeting NDCs by largest emitter is very, very small. And on the if the current trend continues, the probability of staying below two degrees Celsius of warming is only 5%. Uh, 
but that doesn't mean that we have to be uh, pessimistic. That was this is what Paul, you know, think our thinking from what we see in the past. But the future should not be the example from the past. We have to move forward and we have to move more uh, actively. And happy note is that many new entities that are being supported and many new uh, carbon neutrality places are, are coming. And, you know, of course, these carbon neutrality places are there, but, you know, still carbon neutrality places are still for 2050, 2060. Still, I would go back to what, we, what I said earlier is that this, this places for 2030 and the action and the measures, what we need to do right now, that is very, 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 very important. And recently I come across one, uh, you know, recent update by New Climate uh, Institute and the Climate Action uh, the Tracker, uh, which, which put up quite an interesting uh, analysis that, okay, from last September to this May, uh, more countries, including United States, uh, came into the uh, you know this this realm realm. Now that has reduced the gap in emission gap what we have uh, to meet the you know Paris Agreement uh, track by by 2030. So so we have some reason to be hopeful there. But again uh, again what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we have measures, we have uh, technology. Uh, we have people, we have we have a lot of innovations, but action. And Mark rightly said the politics and measures and action. These are something extremely uh, important. And recently, just last last month, International Energy Agency uh, brought out a new report. It's called you know Net Zero Emission 202050 uh, report, where uh, it again re-emphasized the same thing that that most places are. Uh, not at underpin by the near term policies and measures. Typically, 2030 is, is you know, very, very important. So, so what is important here, In if you look at many of these so-called uh, pathways to achieve 1.5 degree uh, Celsius or pathways to 2 degree Celsius, they very much rely on technological solutions. Many different kinds of technological solutions are there. And many of the studies, almost all of them are saying that pathway is very narrow. It's possible, but it's very narrow, uh, but it can be achieved. And many of these studies, you know, are, there, are, there are a number of studies, they hinges on scaling up clean technologies, they hinges on clean energy, more electricity into the system, fully renewable electricity, more electric vehicles, some economic restructuring, and some of the new innovation in technologies under development. So these are some of the things which sits into different mitigation pathways, different agencies, different studies has put together. Now, not surprisingly, international energy agencies, this 1.5 uh, net, net zero or net uh, carbon zero, net, net zero 2050 report, again, uh, put a quite a interesting you know number uh, that the renewable energy such as wind and solar has to be significantly upscaled by 2030 in order to follow that 1.5 degree target by 2030. Electric cars need to sold in a huge number. Energy intensity need to improve uh, rapidly. So all and, and also interestingly, uh, IEA report. Uh, lays out some of the important, uh, uh, you know, energy-related, you know, technology that need to be in place by 2030. But the good news is that it tells us that yes, it's possible. It's possible. We can do it. But I'll I'll end my talk with few few points here. So my one personal reflection is that we as a scientists and the scientific community need to keep on working on climate change science, either from climate science or mitigation, adaptation, all in, in you know, all, all fronts. Science must move forward, better understanding is needed, but solution related analysis may be needed more and the action is key. So that this is something that we want all of us to, to remember. Second is uh, the ambitious plan are there now for 2050. 
these ambitious plans have provided a very good signal, right signal to stakeholders for needed change. But immediate actions aiming for 2030 is must once again. And as I said earlier, we have seen sustained and increasing rate of emission reductions globally in you know, many parts of the world. Also, the growth rate of emission has declined. We have to keep that and we have to do our best to rapidly transform ourselves. Now, clean energy technology have lots of prospects. Scaling up policies are important. I'd again go back to what Mark said earlier is that policies and politics is very, very important and a must. We have technology, we have people, we have innovations. We can, we are likely to be able to do it, but we need the right policies, we need the right politics, we need a better investment. We have to stop investing in fossil fuel sector. We have to divest to the renewable energy sector. We have to invest in the energy efficiency and, and the renewable energy in unprecedented scale. We have to do that. I'm sure uh, our next speaker, Rokia, will also uh, would agree with that for energy efficiency, particularly for the built environment. Then lots of innovation is needed, R&D investments. Still, there are a lot of technology we need to improve in order to get into 1.5 degree trajectory. So innovation takes time. R&D investment is very, very important. Least, last but not the least, international cooperation is very important. Uh, we know that it's not an easy thing. We know that there's a lot of politics around it. But you are a nation framework convention on climate change have so-called three means of implementation, climate financing, technology transfer, and capacity building. So on all these three fronts, we can't wait. We have to move forward. And from the national governments, local governments, provincial governments, we can't rely on piecemeal based policy approach. We need far reaching economy wide policies. So these are some of the most important things that we should do in the near future. Again, I repeat, we have lots of things. We have technologies, urgent action, urgent action, policies and political. These are the most important for us to move forward. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you very much, Shabaka. That's very, uh, gave me a sense of urgency. We, we definitely need to, to get a move on. If you could stop the slide share, that would be fantastic. And Rokia can start to get ready. Um, actually echoes last week's uh, presentation as well, where we were talking about very similar um, accelerating decarbonization. And I think that's the this essence of your argument today is we need to get a move on to get to 2030. We, we need something like the Green New Deal. The, that sort of level of ambition, and maybe it's coming, maybe it's coming, but we'll have to see. So let's hope uh, so. yeah, let's hope so. Um, okay, Rokia, over to you now. Um, thank you very much, Brendan, and, and thank you to Mark and Shavakar for their amazing presentations. Um, they very much looked at the macro scale. My presentation will look at more of the micro scale impacts of climate change, specifically work, uh, focusing on workplaces and within the context of developing countries. Um, oh, she seems to have frozen. Hello? Oh, hi. Yes. Yes, you're back. Hi. Sorry, my internet connection was unstable. Apologies. No problem. And then, um, I'm at, uh, okay, so, and then finally go into the research we've been undertaking in this area, um, specifically on the resilience of micro, small and medium industrial workplaces in developing countries. Um, like I mentioned, I work for part of UCL called the Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering. And at UCL, we pursue a deeper understanding of the interactions between the built environment, health, human well-being, productivity, energy use, and climate change. We aim to uh, do this to deliver interdisciplinary built environment research to improve health, well-being, and sustainability. So the topic of this lecture series, and specifically this presentation, is very much at the intersection of our research interests and our skills. So in terms of the context, 
the climate crisis is one of the greatest challenges facing humanity today. It affects every country and can have devastating effects on both communities and individuals, as we've seen from the presentations um, that came before. But it is especially important for developing countries uh, because they are most impacted by climate change and they are least able to afford its consequences. Um, their vulnerability is due to a number of factors that can limit their ability to prevent um, and uh, to their ability to prevent and respond to the impacts of climate change. And in fact, climate change can potentially reverse significant development gains made in these countries, so it has wide ranging impacts. Um, in terms of the built environment, which is where my interest is, um, it is well known that buildings are responsible for about 30 to 50 percent of all energy consumed and carbon emissions emitted, so they are a big part of the climate challenge. Uh, but in the future, under business as usual projections, building energy use will double or triple by the year 2100, making them an even bigger contributor to the climate crisis. Um, this is driven by increased access to better buildings and electricity. And this infograph uh, is a simple representation of how this is manifested in Egypt. In Egypt in 1999, there were just under 200 air conditioning units. By the year 2012, this had gone up to 6 million units. This is because people wanted better internal environments or what they thought were better internal environments, but also electricity became more accessible and cheaper. So in an attempt to make their internal environments better, they were actually contributing more to the energy crisis and to the climate change problems. But this said, buildings do offer near-term and very highly cost-effective opportunities to cut energy demand growth rates and even reverse them in some developing countries. So in terms of the impact of climate change on the built environment, uh, this simplified graph shows the interaction between buildings, climate change, and the subsequent potential effects on building occupants and the environment. And when we talk about workplaces, the ones that we are most interested in are, are mainly to do with reduced productivity um, in the workplace, with um, impact on um, financial um, income and the ability to carry out the economic uh, tasks, even stopping it in some cases, or relocation uh, or displacement of that workplace. To focus down even more on one of these, which I'll choose to speak about during this presentation, um, one of the main impacts uh, we have spoken about in the past few years is the effect of increasing heat as a result of climate change uh, on productivity and performance. The key aspect here is referred to as heat stress. And heat stress is defined as the net or the overall heat burden on the body. And this comes from a combination of the heat generated while someone is working, plus heat from environmental sources, such as air temperature, humidity, air movement, radiation from the hot sun, or from sources that surround it, as well as clothing requirements. Um, there are several factors contributing to heat stress. Uh, we've spoken about the worker, the work that is undertaken, but also a lot of it comes from the environment that surrounds the worker that is uh, uh, while they are undertaking this work. And in our field, we like to focus down on not just the general environment, but specifically the built environment. So the building or the internal environment where this work is taking place. And the effects of heat stress can be um, quite significant, actually. So increase, increased workplace heat as a result of climate change is expected to result in work capacity and labour productivity losses. And it can have a significant impact on human well-being, population health, national health services and local economies. And labour productivity is a key metric here. I'll... I'll uh, if my internet connection is unstable, slightly sorry. Um, labor productivity is a key metric here um, and is the amount or volume of output that is obtained from each employee. It's a key measure of business efficiency. So, heat not only impacts a society, society's health um, and well being, but also its economic well being. Um, this table summarizes a study that NASA um, um, undertook in, I think, 1968, and is one of the, sort of the, the vanguard of work in this area. And it shows the loss of output and accuracy as temperatures go up. So you get a relatively modest loss in output of about 3% when the effective temperature is 24. This increases um, um, 
gradually to quite a significant 79% loss of outputs as you reach 41 degrees centigrade and a very high loss in accuracy. And to relate it to workplaces, this graph shows the increasing impacts, both the mental, the physiological and the psychological impacts on people in workplaces as temperatures go up. Um, and it very much ties into a lot of studies in this area, which have showed things like increased absences, uh, increased um, uh, likelihood of accidents occurring and a decrease in, in, in productivity, especially in um, areas such as uh, metal industries, as well as um, uh, garment manufacturing as well. So what are the pathways for addressing impacts of heat in workplaces? Some of these have been discussed in the, in the last two presentations, so I'll touch on some of these as well. Um, one of the main functions of a building in a hot climate is to minimize heat stress imposed by the external environment. And we do this via different measures, such as passive design measures. Uh, most architects are very familiar with these. These include things like building orientation and shading, um, looking at building materials, um, installing engineering controls, such as um, those used for general ventilation and spot cooling, shielding using um, shading um, from heat, radiant heat sources, and evaporative cooling, mechanical refrigeration, and cooling fans to reduce heat. And the last kind of set are more energy intensive. Um, but a lot of these measures, or a lot of studies around the impact of these measures have focused on workplaces in developed countries and developed economies. And very few have really looked at what happens in developing countries, um, which are mostly cooling dominate, dominated around the year. This graph also shows sort of the mismatch between um, the policy available in terms of building energy efficiency and climate change around the world. Um, the dark blue indicates countries where, are, where there are building codes that relate to energy efficiency. And as you can see, most of them are in developed economies around the world. The green and gray and yellow show um, degrees of building codes that do exist, but most of them are either voluntary or don't even exist at all. So there's a de definite mismatch in terms of policy. And one of the reasons for this is the lack of evidence. Um, I tried to look at studies that uh, looked at how buildings can adapt to climate change in the future around the world and found this very interesting literature review that looked at key scientific literature on climate adaptation published in the last five years. So the most up-to-date work in this area. Um, the literature review had work from 22 countries and looked at an array of different approaches to adapt to climate change, but unfortunately, mostly focused on developed economies and mostly in the UK, which is heating dominated till now. And even if we look at evidence from um, not a building's perspective, but an occupational health perspective, um, this graph shows the mismatch in terms of the amount of research that is undertaken. Um, so these are the number of papers published on occupational health per million uh, population in different countries. As you can see, for the least developed countries, it's on the lower side compared to the most developed countries where um, the papers are quite extensive in this area. So the degree of development also seems to dictate so far how much interest there is in looking at research in terms of climate change adaptation for the built environment and its impact on workplaces. With this in mind, at UCL a number of years ago, we uh, decided to embark on our own research portfolio that looked at not only workplaces, but perhaps look at not uh, the general context of the environments that are around us, but in, developed, uh, in developing economies. Um, from my perspective, um, I decided to focus on micro, small and medium industrial workplaces. Uh, and these are businesses whose personnel, so the number of people who work in them and their revenue fall beyond certain limits. Um, this ranges between under 10 for micro uh, enterprises to under 250 for medium enterprises. The table there summarizes the thresholds in the EU, but they are similar everywhere around the world. Um, and they're very important parts of the global economy because they are part of the global supply chain. So we, in, in even developed countries, um, our supply chains rely on these small 
um, industries in developing nations. Um, and in emerging economies, four out of five every new jobs are created within uh, MFMs. Um, they're not only important for the economy, they are also important for social equity. Many of them are set up by women entrepreneurs and are reliant on a large female workforce, especially, say, for example, in the garment industries where over 50% of workers are actually female. Um, they are also very much under-researched. Um, there are less resources within the MSM workplace uh, context to tackle impacts of climate change, including heat stress. There is less regulation and policy that govern them, whereas with larger industries, there is more regulation and policy. And because they are very much part of the community and embedded within the fabric of the local economy, there are more diverse impacts and opportunities for uh, ensuring their climate resilience. And the climate resilience is very important for a variety of reasons on a policy scale. Um, so the sustainable growth of the sector is contingent on addressing impacts of global warming and increasing heat. Um, and this should be done by considering insulation, shading, natural ventilation, without adding to the energy burden that then adds to the energy crisis that then contributes to climate change. And looking at them now is very timely because there are numerous global efforts to ensure decent working conditions and these are tied to a lot of the SDGs. Um, and there are also lots of national if, uh, energy efficiency action plans which are being revised now to make sure that these workplaces um, are both resilient and offer um, healthy environments for those who work in them. And we've talked extensively about the SDGs in the last presentations. Uh, but what I can say is ensuring the climate resilience of these micro, small and medium workplaces addresses the ODA or the Office of Development Assistance here in the UK's priority of sustaining growth around the world while reducing energy and emissions. Um, so they are in fact part of our climate commitment here in the UK and in many developed countries. Um, there, it is aligned with the COP26 themes of adaptation and resilience and also of energy transitions. And they map onto several SDGs. Um, I've put a few up, mostly SDG 13, which is action to combat climate change. Um, and it has significant implications across others, such as three health and eight decent work. So they're, they're, even though they're small, um, their importance is, is, is very, very high. So with that in mind, um, the first project we undertook at UCL, um, the acronym SHAPIRO, which stands for Climate, Health and Productivity Impact Reduction via Architectural and Urban Design, um, which was a small pilot study. Um, and it focused on the Egyptian context, um, which is quite an interesting context because it is a developing economy that is highly, highly vulnerable to climate change. It, it also has a rapidly growing population, and I saw a question about that in the Q&A, and is also a rapidly growing economy, um, both of which represents a considerable burden on the power grid, and this in 2012 resulted in a series of rolling blackouts simply because everyone was turning on their air conditioning and their fans to cope with the heat. Um, the overall economic cost of these power outages were substantial. Um, and the World Bank actually found that daily production losses of over 25% occurred during these outages. So we've gone from climate change to actual economic impacts very quickly there. Um, and this, um, image shows why this has been such a problem in Egypt. Um, of course, all of you are probably very um, um, familiar with urban heat islands, and this shows the growing urban heat island around Cairo and the urban areas that surround it from 1984 to 2002. Um, the urban heat island grows, is thought to grow by one degree, uh, I think, or about three degrees per one million uh, population, in Cairo back then, the population was 15 million, so you can imagine the impact of that. And now I think it's getting towards 20 million. So it's a very kind of challenging context. Um, and within this context, MSMs play a key role. They are a gateway to employment and community economic development. And in Egypt, 2.5 million um, MSM created jobs exist. And these comprise about 75% of the labor force. So with that in mind, we decided to pick two uh, in Egypt to look at how climate change was impacting productivity within them. And there were two factories 
um, one in central Cairo and one um, outside of central Cairo, so an, a, a peri-urban area called El Shuruk City. And we looked at the current levels of thermal discomfort and potential reduction of labor productivity in both of them. These are pictures of the two factories. One was sort of a heavy duty carpentry workshop, while the other was a garment manufacturing uh, um, uh, workshop, which was effectively um, one floor in a residential building. So very different places. We put monitoring equipment um, in each of these and looked at the temperatures and relative humidity. And these are some of the findings from the study. So as you can see, the indoor dry bulb air temperature um, um, for in each was quite high. And um, as you can see from the graph, we monitored in October and November, so not the peak summer period. However, temperatures were constantly above 25 degrees centigrade. And in one of the factories, this was um, also um, accompanied by a quite a high indoor relative humidity percentage, making it even more challenging for the people to work. Um, we took some of this data and statistically analyzed it um, through a model called the Climate Change Health Impact and Prevention Tool. And we found that um, in the two workplaces, uh, the temperature was over the 25 degree threshold, which we would consider to be acceptable for the level of um, activity in them for more than 30% of the time. So even in autumn, temperatures were 30% uh, were over 25 degrees centigrade for more than a third of the time that people were in these uh, factories. We spoke to the owners of these factories and they said, well, we're happy to put more air conditioning units to make it more comfortable, but this is, of course, what we don't need. We don't need the unintended consequence of adding to the problem of climate change while trying to make the indoor environment better. And this gave rise to the second research project, which is this one, Climate Resilience of Micro, Small and Medium Industrial Workplaces which aim to take this research one step further by aiming to look at how to mitigate the impacts of climate change and create a healthy work environment via non-energy intensive means. So what can we do before we go down the air conditioning uh, route? The project was funded by the British Council Research Links and Climate Change Grant and brought together teams from UCL um, Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering and the American University in Cairo and was supported by mentors and input from a number of distinguished academics from both Cairo University in Egypt and um, Oxford Brookes University here in the UK. And the project aimed to bring together UK and Egypt early career researchers with experts to address the challenge of retrofitting these workplaces um, without going down the air conditioning route as a first step. Um, and also with their input to deliver co-produced strategies to achieve this, and also to give all of these early care researchers the opportunity to win funding for their own project, um, such as the one I described earlier. The longer term uh, uh, goals of, these project, of this project included um, supporting international development related research on climate change, contributing to the capacity building of ECRs, so getting all that research uh, critical mass going because as we mentioned, there's very little research in this area and establishing links between the UK and Egypt with long term sustainability. In the UK, we might not be um, critically in need of the research now, but it will inform how we address the same problems which are going to happen in our own building stock going forward. This is also part of the COP26 activity, so it will be featured there. Um, as part of our own institutional response and the British Council response and contribution to COP26. The workshop format basically was a three day format. Uh, the first was context setting, the second was knowledge exchange and capacity building, and the third was looking at future pathways. It included a number of activities um, such as breakout sessions, presentations, networking between the ECRs to get them to team build, and discussion panels with stakeholders from the community, which included employees who owned MSMs as well as policy makers in Egypt. And the, uh, I'd like to add that the workshop only take, took place last Thursday, so we're still analysing some of the uh, outputs, 
Um, but this is, um, these are some of our interactive mirror boards, which we used with the 30 or so participants uh, who attended um, um, and, and, and uh, which will help us develop co-produced strategies for MSM climate resilience in Egypt. And um, in terms of the initial outcomes, we were able to announce a UK Egypt climate resilience in buildings uh, research network and we were able to initiate uh, the challenge prizes. So we will be funding four pilot projects to look at four different uh, MSMs in Egypt. Um, and we're encouraging UK and Egypt teams to work together. So there's that knowledge transfer. And we will be delivering some outcomes in November during COP26, but also in March of next year. Um, so this is a very quick whirlwind tour of the work we've been doing in this area. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. This is my email. And if you're interested in the last project, this is the website where you can get more information about these uh, challenge prizes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rocky. I, I noticed that while you were presenting, Mark was answering some of the questions. Um, thank you very much for that, Mark. Uh, I see we have about 10 minutes left. I wonder, do any of the panelists need to dash off uh, exactly uh, 30 minutes past, so maybe we could just uh, respond to some of the questions that are up there. And um, I wonder if we could just begin with Gemma's question, which I think probably, uh, Mark, it might be directed towards you, which is, you know, does reaching emission goals require the richest individuals and corporations to make sacrifices? Um, Win-lose scenarios, e.g. E reduce <clears throat> consumption below, or does it require the richest people to sacrifice and how can we incentivize that? You did talk about win-win solutions being part of the answer there. Just what's your, what's your thinking on that? Um, so I think the first thing we have to do is think what makes you happy, okay? And this is a very simple question. So if you think about the basic needs for humans, uh, decent shelter, access to uh, food on a reliable basis, access to water, um, access to education, access to uh, employment or something that will occupy you that actually and also allows you to be aspirational to help your children aspire to be better than you are. So that's all humans really want. And actually, the interesting thing about the pandemic is what have we missed? Have I missed being able to buy an extra pair of shoes? No. What I've actually missed is being able to hug my family, interacting with my friends, uh, playing sports and things like that. And so I think what's important is when you say, what is the loss? Actually, I think we're going to gain this whole idea that we need to consume to be happy. My parents weren't particularly well off. I'm very well off. I'm a professor at university, but I'm no happier than they were. So I think it's basically what we have to do is unpick this uh, consumer capitalism that we have all been uh, brought up with and actually say, well, hang on, what makes us happy? And so therefore, I think it's really important to unpick all of those ideas about consumption. However, I would also say, one of the things we are very aware and was actually shown up beautifully sort of uh, 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 in the talks is that we do need a lot of energy and we need a lot more energy because we have so many people we want to lift out of uh, energy poverty and poverty itself. And so it's an idea that we don't want to consume, but actually we do need the energy to actually have uh, good housing, good sort of uh, energy uh, on all of that. So I think it's a balancing act. But yes, one of the key things is Oxfam's brilliant number, which is 10% of the richest people, not the richest countries, the richest people actually emit about 50% of the emissions. And I think this is something we have to think about. It is not necessarily country versus country. It is the extreme wealthy people and I include myself in that uh, bracket, in each country which overconsume. Thank you very much. So use avoiding terms like sacrifice or let's say framing the notion of sacrifice as something that's a bad idea uh, doesn't really help us move forward in responding to this challenge. 
And then I think also uh, Shobaka talked about behavioral changes. I think behavioral changes are part of this. They're, they're much, it's a much bigger challenge. Um, and, but that might be uh, something of a chicken and egg. Once we actually start planning and implementing, behavior might follow. Um, Shobaka, there's a couple of questions that I think relate to your uh, presentation around energy. And one of them is from Shah, Hamed Shah and uh, Yohe. I think the two questions quite interconnect. One is, you know, do countries from, you know, um, the richer countries need to help the energy transition in, in the uh, countries of the South? And is there a problem that could emerge from that? And then Jorge is asking, what about the countries that are really dependent on um, exporting fossil fuels? So how, how, do we, how do we deal with those? Actually, this comes up always in the climate negotiations, but it would be nice mm -hmm. to get your perspective on it. Yes, thank you, uh, Brendan. Uh, I think, you know, this, you know, historical responsibility and uh, support from developed countries to developing countries, that has been one of the key point of negotiation. Also, it was enshrined in the UNFCCC with some text called common but differentiated responsibility. That's a UNFCC you know, uh, article text. Now, building on that common but differentiated responsibility, uh, capacity building, uh, financing, and the uh, technology transfer type of concept uh, was propounded. Now, there, again, the whole idea, some of the discussion is that, yes, developed countries emitted lots of emission in the past and caused climate change. Uh, but also we can't ignore the fact that if you look at the recent emission data, it is the developing countries which are emitting more and more now. And if you, let's say, go back to the 2050, and if you see, then you will see that role of developing country also is going to be big. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not blaming one versus other, but, but rather we all need to work together. And in order to work together, we need to have a collaboration and support measures. And given the fact that developed countries are already developed and also there is indeed some historical responsibility. So this uh, supporting in, in very good collaborative fashion uh, for climate financing, technology transfer and capacity building. So these are the places where these two groups of uh, countries come together. And, and many, of the, many of you might have already seen that uh, you know, after the Copenhagen uh, COP meeting and after aftermath, 100 billion US dollar a, a year from 2020 has become a buzzword that developed countries had agreed to mobilize for developing countries, right? So again, this technology transfer also I have a lot of discussion. There is a tra technology transfer mechanism under UNFCCC. Uh, also, there is a lot of you know intellectual property rights, IPR, and many many other other discussions embedded there. And also, UNFCCC has some capacity development related funds created for mitigation and, and adaptation. So, so in a nutshell, these are yes uh, matters of working together, and and in the international community has fairly accepted that yes developed countries will be helping developing countries. So I think I really don't see uh, too much problem on, from, on that front. But of course, again, we need to implement that. And, and also we have to find a good mechanism for border sharing. So I think uh, that's, that's what only I, I can tell you at this moment. And uh, Brendan, what was the second question on the exp Yeah, it was basically what, um, how do we deal with fossil fuel dependent countries or fossil fuel producing countries. And, uh... Yes, you know, fossil fuel producing countries uh, definitely might be not feeling very easy. You know, you know of course, uh, there's a reason for that because, you know, once, uh, once the fossil fuel is shifts to renewable energy, uh, the energy dependence and, and there's a business market, you know, influence, lots of things would affect uh, but uh, but I think you know in in any case fossil fuel is not going to stay there for too long time, especially if perhaps the things like oil. But of course we also say that sometimes the resource is a function of technology, reserve is a function of you know technology. Uh, but I think more or less there is no dispute uh, internationally that 
we need to shift to the renewable energy. So I think it is important for fossil fuel producing countries to also slowly restructure their economy, go towards more greener technology and, and do a transition. So hopefully the world will be moving to that direction. So I think it's time for them also to start thinking about the, the transition and, and the structure of economy over the years. Thank you. Yeah, really the uh, fossil fuel dependent countries should be investing out of fossil fuel um, and some, some are doing, but not, but not enough. Um, right. Rokia, there's a que question for you uh, are from Zhao Yu, who wants to know about, you talked a lot about the de design phase of buildings and how, uh, how to, um, cert certain measures that can be implemented at that stage. And the question is, well, what is it that can be actually done during the usage phase or operational phase to kind of respond to the challenges that you've been identifying? Um, a lot of these are originally design measures, but they are in fact things that we use in the retrofit of buildings. And this is both in the UK context and abroad. So almost all of them can be implemented also after the building is built and is operational. Um, the extent to which they can be incorporated varies. So for example, things like putting in controls is a lot easier than say, um, working um, or upgrading the building fabric, but they are both um, at design phase and at retrofit phase later on. Yeah, Lila wants to know about the green building concept. Um, how effective has it been in, in decreasing emissions during the construction phase? Um, I mean, if, uh, if Lila could just be a bit more specific, um, um, I'll, I'll try to answer it, but uh, uh, during the construction process, um, I won't touch on the work I've done here, but I've, I'll touch on other work that I've done. We did a comparison between the uh, life cycle uh, assessment of retrofitting a building and building a building. And if you retrofitted a building, the carbon footprint of that building was always less than, than building it more. So you effectively uh, took out uh, the construction uh, process uh, related emissions and carbon footprint. I hope that answers it to some extent, Leila. And if not, please do specify a bit more. Well, I actually think we've almost answered all the questions now. And um, uh, thank you guys for working away in the background. Um, I really do appreciate the fact that you, we've been able to respond to the questions and we're, we're almost, we're only a couple of minutes over time. So I think with that, it is a good point to, to wrap up. And I want to thank all three panelists for really excellent presentations today. I felt that they interconnected really well and that you also echoed each other, which is, um, you know, really uh, uh, very, very important. But I, I, came, I come away from this with a sense of urgency. And I also feel like we need to be, uh, we need to do more of these presentations uh, <laughs> over this year and over the next 10 years, because I think this is part of the challenge that we face is to uh, reach as many people as possible. And that's why I really am so um, happy that you, you, you agreed to participate in this event. And I, I feel also you share the same notion that we do need to be out there communicating these ideas. Uh, if you would like to end with a, a, a remark from each of you, that would, be, that would be wonderful. And then I can bring things to a close. Perhaps, Mark, you would like to kick off. Um, so just to send people away with uh, an additional thought, uh, what's really interesting about the last presentation and, of course, uh, heat is actually one of the biggest concerns we have on the Lancet Commission for Global Change, uh, global, Climate Change and Global Health is actually agriculture. Because, of course, as heating increases, the actual number of days where it's physically impossible to work outside on the land increases. And we know that small farmers are responsible for feeding half the population of the world. So I'd love to be cheerful, but I'm just gonna pick up and throw that out there as a little hand grenade just to say, yep, yeah, but actually heating up the planet makes it harder to work outside and to produce the food that we need to feed our population. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Shabaka? Yeah, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, I do only say that it was a very good event. I learned, uh, I learned a lot from Mark and uh, Rokia also. And, and you know, I'm very happy to uh, keep engaged with uh, some of you. Uh, you know, if you have any question, maybe I was not too prompt in answering question, but, but I saw that Mark was very, very active in answering questions. So if you have any uh, question, please feel free to come back come back to me, but I would only say that for any deep decarbonization pathway, what is important is technology and our lifestyle and, and behavior change. You know, if you look at many of these technological these pathways for 1.5 degree, they bank a lot and lot on technology. I'm not saying technology, we need technology. Technology is absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. Unless we don't change our lifestyle, behavior, and consumption pattern, uh, we can't move forward. So I think in that front, usually the attention is much less. And in all the discussion, mostly revolves around some of the big technology and especially energy technology. So this behavior and consumption uh, choice, I think this is some important part of this puzzle that we should not forget at all, but rather very important. Thank you. I totally agree with you on that. Thank you so much. Rokia? Um, I don't have much to uh, add except to thank you for inviting me to present and to thank Shovka and Mark for their very interesting presentations and for the participants for all their interesting questions. Um, please email me if you want to discuss any of the things um, within my presentation. I'd be happy to answer your question. Thank you so much. Yes, the um, PDS will go online tomorrow as will a recording of this, uh, this session. Uh, thanks to the panelists. I know you're really very busy people, and I really appreciate you uh, giving us time for this anniversary lecture series. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, you can already see it's dark, it's dark outside here in Japan, and I'm sure our participants are looking forward to going home and having their dinner. Um, just one final announcement is that next week's webinar is on the uh, net zero carbon energy transition. And I think it follows on uh, um, to a lot of the points that were made today. And I hope that you will, you will all join next week. So thanks again, everybody, for this this event. And it's been a it's been a pleasure to moderate it. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Please take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Yes, you too. Thank you.